Hello everyone, so good to have you back at House of Refuge Church, Pastor James Jeffries. I want to talk to you this morning about salvation, then what? You know, what I'm, I'm, as a minister I see people and I, and I look at how they're living and, and I, I'm not the, trying to pass judgment, but what I do see is that it seems like people get saved so that they don't go to hell or for some other reason, but what about after you get saved? You know, I always say this, if the Lord intended for us to just get saved and then go to heaven, we all would have dropped dead as soon as we got saved. But there's a reason why we're still here. And I'm gonna talk about some things that we need to understand so that we would be a better witness here on this earth. There's a lot of unsaved people out there and as the day gets closer to the Lord's coming in the tribulation time, more and more people are falling away from Christianity. More and more people need to be saved out there, but they're pulling away. Because the church, I think the church is to blame in many cases. I'm part of the church, so blame myself also for not being an effective witness, for not being, a, not being able to convince them that they need salvation, they need Jesus Christ. So I'm going to talk to you about some things this morning. We need to live it. So in other words, salvation is something that we need to live. There's, we have to live out our days here on the earth. Some, some time back I preached a message on occupy until I come. And in that message I talked about what does that mean to occupy? Does it mean to blend in with the world? Or does it mean to be in a position in which we are like traffic signs or one way signs or this is the way to God type of thing. He's the way, the truth, and the life. But we should be pointing to him. And so I'm going to show you a few things this morning that we need to know. We need to live it, not blend in with this world. I'm not saying we can't go places or go on vacations and all. That's not what I'm talking about. Because I think we need to go on vacations to be with our family, but also to be around the lost. You never know what opportunity you'll get to share the gospel what opportunity you get to just be there and be like a beacon of light for them. I want to talk about that in just a second. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul writes to the Corinthians and he says, You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. So Paul's writing to the Corinthian church, and he's telling them just what I'm trying to tell you right now. He's saying, people are reading us. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, it's not like we have words written on us. It means that when, we, when we're not cursing, people start trying to figure us out. Why doesn't this person curse? Why is that person not upset over this stuff? Why? Why are they always doing this and saying that? So they're, they're, they're seeing and hearing us, and they're trying to figure us out. So they are reading us. You know, I read people. I read when I go places, and I'm in the grocery store someplace, and I'm, I'm watching the people around me, and uh, I'm reading people when I see that they could use a helping hand, or when uh, they're cursing or upset, I can begin to pray, and my, hopefully that as I'm praying, that they would feel that peace of God. You know, it's a way in which I can live, but I'm, I'm reading people to see, oh, they're stressed out over this life. Then you listen. You give them a minute, they'll talk to you, they'll tell you about things in this life and how they're upset about things. But the same thing with us, when we're calm, and we're at peace inside, and we got our focus on Jesus, people start trying to read us to find out how come that person's not stressed out? And then they might start pouring out their stress on you. It's an opportunity to tell them about how I put all my care upon the Lord. You know, so we got to watch this opportunity. But Paul writes to them and says, look, look, you Corinthians, the unsaved out there are reading you. They're trying to figure you out. Why aren't you doing the sexual things anymore? Why are you pulling away from all these these places that you used to go to. You see, they're trying to figure you out, so they're, they're reading you. And, like Paul said, 
that we are epistles written by Paul. Paul wrote this epistle. I read it. I get it inside of me. I begin to try to live according to the word of God. And people start reading the written epistle of Paul, who has been inspired by the Holy Spirit to write this. Here are some things that Christians should be thinking about. Now, I'm not, you know, there's a lot of things we should be thinking about, so I don't have them all, but here are some things. Number one, what does it mean to be the salt of the earth? Now, Jesus said in Matthew 5, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. So this is an interesting statement. Jesus starts speaking this after he finished the Beatitudes. And he said, bless, bless all, all the ones who are persecuted and so forth. Um, bless all the peacemakers, they are the children of God and so forth. But this starts to take place after that. And he says, you are the salt of the earth. What, what does that mean? What was he meaning when he said, you are the salt of the earth? But he said, if it loses its flavor. Now, at the time Jesus lived, and even on to, all the way up to now, we use salt to season our food. A little salt, a little pepper, you know, whatever. But he's talking about seasoning. So you can, you can look at this and add not just salt, but you can add pepper. You can add um, different types of things that we use to season our food. So basically, he's saying that you are the seasoning of the earth. You add flavor to the blandness of life. You know, so what does he mean by salt? Well, salt is a preservative. They put salt and meat back in the day because they didn't have refrigerators and so forth to preserve food for a little longer. So when they, when they slaughtered an animal, they could salt that meat and that meat would stay good longer. You know, so the idea is that we are keeping back the judgment of God on this earth. You see, we're in this world and we are beacons the Lord connects to us. And wherever we are, we are adding salt. God will send us to places that people are upset with everything. You know, you might wake up one morning and, and uh, you think, okay, I, I got to go to the grocery store today. Well, God might be moving on you to go to the grocery store because there's people there that need a little salt in their life. You see, they're, they're cursing, they're upset, they're mad, they're angry, and... Man, it's all over the place, the anger of people. But you might be just the salt that causes them to say, man, you know, that tastes good, spiritually speaking. So you're holding back judgment. You see, when they're cursing and everything, they deserve judgment. They, 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 they deserve to reap what they've been sowing. But when we're there, we're adding a little salt. We make people think, man, this person here is not cursing. I wonder why. You know, so that salt is like... When you eat some food and it's, and it's salted just right, you, you know, wow, that tastes good. And so when you're someplace and people are all upset and everything, but you have that calmness, they'll say, wow, I want to be like that person. I don't want to be angry. I don't want to be upset. Why? What's causing them to not rail up and get all upset about things? Well, because we're the salt of the earth. We've been seasoned by God. God has salted us with his presence. He has come upon us with his glory. He has given us his Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit calms us down. The Holy Spirit comes and gives us peace and causes us to be able to live in this world and not react to it. If you are, as a Christian, if you're reacting to things on this earth, because there are some bad things going on in, this, in our country and our government and all around us, if you're reacting to all of that, and you're having a negative attitude towards it, well, let me tell you something. You better check out your salt content. You know, the church in Ephesus had lost their first love. In um, Revelation chapter 2, Jesus said, I have one thing against you. You're doing everything you're supposed to be doing, but I got one thing against you. You had left your first love. You don't have the fire and the passion that you had for me. You know, so if you're upset with what's going on in the world, maybe you, you have shifted a lot of focus onto this world. This world's going to pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word will not pass away. So we are preservative. 
God has given you his presence, the salt of heaven, so that you, you can be at peace and rest. And when people are come into your presence, they should be able to feel that, just like we should taste that salt. Now, what does it mean to be called the light of the world? In Matthew 5, once again, right after the salt, it says, You are the light of the world. A city and a set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under the basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, right here in these scriptures, the Lord's saying that you are light in this world. So not only did he make a salt to be a, at peace and rest around the stir, disturbed people around us, to have a good taste, he's also made us the light of the world. You know, when you, when you got people coming on over to your house at night, you put the front porch light on so they can read the address on the wall and then pull up and they won't trip and stumble coming to the front door. So you put the light on. Well, that's what God has done. Every time, you know, um, the people are walking in darkness. They're out there walking in sin. And every time they come by us, we begin to light up. We light up what? We light up the door. Who's Jesus? We're going to see that in just a minute. We are the light on the front porch of heaven. You know, the Lord in Matthew 23 rebuked the Pharisees. He said, you don't enter in and you block the way for others to enter in. And so we don't want to block the way. We want to show them the way. We are the light on the, the wall of heaven, so to speak. We're showing them how to have that peace and joy that we're supposed to have. We shouldn't be upset over this world. We're supposed to be angry, but, not, but sin not, and we're not supposed to let the, the sun go down on our wrath. There's times when we should be angry. We should be angry when they're murdering babies in the womb. We should be angry when they're abusing mankind, when they, with the sins of this world. We should be angry about that stuff, but we should be taking it to the Lord in prayer. We got to learn how to, to give it to God, and so we can walk in that peace and joy and happiness, even in the midst of a terrible world. You know, so we are the light. God has, has saved us and left us here to be a light to those that walk in darkness. You need, to, you need to illuminate God's word and God's uh, presence. By how, how do we do that? Well, you know, the last time I was on vacation, I was sitting down in the midst of people coming and going in the hotel and I was waiting for Julie to come down. And I began to pray in the spirit, under my breath, but I was praying in the spirit. And God showed me how I was being a beacon. As people were passing by, I was being a light to them. And I thought about that. I said, no way that I can prove that. No way can I look at those people and see what, was I really making a difference? But God told me I was. You know, I was being a light. God had me right there in that foyer, in that, in that hotel, and I was just being a light. And um, people, as they would pass me out, I, I was feeling like they were beginning to feel the presence of God. You know, Peter walked to the temple, and as he walked, people were putting sick people out in the street so his shadow would heal them. Just the presence of the Lord that was on Peter, his shadow was healing some of them as he walked by. You know, and that's how we are. We have the presence of God. And that presence of God illuminates himself. So we're not illuminating ourselves, even though we're doing good works and people see the good works, but we're glorifying God. And that's what it says here, so they will glorify the Father in heaven. Are you glorifying the Father in heaven today? Are you glorifying yourself? You know, we can use that light to glorify ourselves. There are churches out there and ministers that that are like they have a following and it you know it can happen no matter what but they got to be real careful how they're doing things because they could be glorifying themselves and not glorifying Jesus at all so we got to try every day to let our light shine upon who Jesus is Every good thing we do, when, if people were to ask us, why, why are you smiling? Say, I'm smiling because I'm seeing Jesus. 
yeah, I see the bad things in this world, but Jesus is the answer. You know, so we're illuminating Jesus. We're lighting up who Jesus is by the life that we live. That's how good works. Number three, what does it mean to turn the other cheek? Now, that's an interesting one. I see Christians today getting as angry as the world is, and they don't want to turn the other cheek. They want to get in somebody's face. I know the feeling. The flesh, the flesh gets railed up when somebody cuts me off on the road, and I have to stay up on top of that. I have to stay diligent on top of that to pray and just stay in the, in the attitude of praise. Here in Matthew 5, he says, You have heard that it was said, An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Turn the other cheek. So if they slap you, he says, turn the cheek and let him slap you on the other one. You know, Jesus did not open his mouth when they were beating him, and plucking his beard and spitting on him. And he didn't repay them anything. Peter drew his sword and cut the, the ear off of the servant. And Jesus put the ear back on him. And he said, put up your sword. He who lives by the sword shall die by the sword. He was saying, if someone slaps you and you slap them back, then you're going to live a life of being slapped. I hear people all the time complain, and they, they go back into time, into, back in their history. Oh, man, I remember back 20 years ago when this person did me this, or when that person did me that. You see, they just they can't, they can't forget it. They can't move on in life. They're just locked away in some pain and suffering that somebody caused them. So that's not turning the other cheek. If you were to turn the other cheek and begin to just worship and praise and just begin to pray for that person, God will set you free from, from all of that back stuff in the past. I mean, I was hurt. I still remember things that my dad did me and all. But I also know my dad's in heaven because I led him to Jesus Christ. And I love my dad, but I didn't back before I was saved. But the Lord taught me how to forgive him. And I don't carry any grief or sorrow or pain or, or anguish or, or thoughts on what my dad did me as a boy. I remember it. But it's like it didn't really happen to me. See, it's like somebody else. That was the old life that I lived. Well, there's people walking around who, who just wants to pay these people back that slapped them. And they're living a miserable life because of it. But turn the other cheek. So just yield the other cheek to him. Here, you want to slap this? Slap this side too. But you know what? I love you. And I'm praying for you. And just tell them, you know. Say, you know, I'm praying for you. I'm praying that, that you would know Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's hard to turn the other cheek because they'll continue to just punch you. Well, the Lord will get you out of that situation. But you still have to stay in the attitude of forgiveness. That's what it means to turn the other cheek. Forgive. Let them go. Let God deal with them. You know, Scripture says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. He doesn't want us to have vengeance on people. God knows how to deal with those people. We got to pray for their soul because they're going to fall into the hands of a living God. And believe me, that's not going to be good. But if we walk in forgiveness by turning the other cheek and walk away and just forgive, you'll be blessed. You'll be a blessed person. This is what Christians are supposed to do. Number four, what does it mean to go the extra mile. You know, the scriptures tell us to go that extra mile. It says in Matthew 5, 41, and whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. You know, that's an interesting thing. You know, scriptures teach us how to be a servant. Now, we, it's easy to serve someone who will serve us back. But what about people that don't serve back? What about people that just have a just a nasty attitude and, and so forth. And they just want you to do, oh, you're a Christian here, carry this, here, do this. Oh, you're not a good Christian. They, they begin to judge us for, because we, we still live in the flesh. But if we start developing an attitude of service, to be a servant, when they compel you to go a mile, if you were really a Christian, you'd help me. Help me go this mile. Here, I got all this stuff to carry. So then you pick it up and you go 
the full distance. It doesn't necessarily mean a mile. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're walking with somebody. It just means like, for instance, I'll just give you for instance, um, persons carrying stuff and they can't carry everything up, you know, up the stairs. So you pick up the rest of the stuff and carry it up there with them. Just something simple like that. They might say thank you. Sometimes people don't thank you. You know, you go to the post office and, you know, what I do before I get to the door is I look around and see who's coming. And if I see somebody coming that's carrying packages, I wait for them and open, it, and open the door. And they smile and they say thank you. But I've had times when they just, I opened, they must have thought I was the service guy, the guy who opens the door, because they didn't even say thank you. They just, they went right on in. You know, that's okay. The thank you that I get is from God. You know, that's, that's the extra mile. You know, or there might be a second door. So you go, you open that door, you let them in, then you hurry up and go open up the next door for them. That's going the extra mile. There's so many ways that you can go the extra mile. You could be on the road and see somebody with a flat tire. Might, might stop and change that tire. Hot day. This, this, this is what it's talking about. You get an opportunity to be a Christian. You get an opportunity to, to tell them that Jesus loves them by demonstration, you know. All these things I brought up today, you know, doing good works to glorify God. You know, all of this all ties in together. You know, it's when Jesus made that statement that was the Romans that were there in the days of, of Jesus and they were oppressing the Jews and they were making the Jews carry stuff for them and, and so forth. Well, what Jesus was saying, he said, love your enemies. Pray for those that despitefully use you. And he said this, if that soldier gives you his gear to carry and he makes you walk that mile, when you get finished with that mile, you say, you got to go further? And they might say, yeah, I got another mile to go. Well, come on, let's go. And you help him carry another mile. That, that Roman that was laughing at you and making you do something is now wondering, man, what kind of person is this? I did this to make a slave out of him, but instead, he wants to serve me. What's the deal with that? You see, but in this world, there are ways in which we can go the extra mile. But a lot of times, we're so wrapped up on ourselves, we're so focused on what people have done us, we're so focused on the pains of this life that we fail to see the opportunities that's at hand. I have failed to see many opportunities, and there's times when I'm laying in bed and I go to bed, I remember some of them, and it's, it's, it breaks my heart that I didn't do more, that I didn't talk to my neighbor on the other side of the fence, and, and things like that that I think, man, I could have said this and I could have said that. Well, if I would have been more in tune to, to what these scriptures say, which is the way a Christian should live, if I'd have been a little more in tune, I would have been able to do more. But I was so focused on my own life and getting something done, I really didn't want to stop and talk to these people. It's my fault and it's a shame and I'm telling you about it. But if we would focus on the Lord, worship, praise, you, you get that opportunity. You won't miss, sometimes you'll still miss, but you won't miss many opportunities that could be just a wonderful way in which to be a witness and a testimony. There's people out there that need Jesus and you have him in your heart and you need to share him. If we get more focused on these things that Jesus taught, you know, on how to live. It has nothing to do with the law, but it has everything to do with living that Christian life. And these things are a witness and a testimony on how to go the extra mile. Now, what exactly is the narrow gate? You know, the scripture says in Matthew 7, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. All right, so we see Jesus saying we have to enter in the narrow gate, and few people find it. Well, covering the whole base of what I just talked about, the salt, the light, you know, getting slapped on the cheek, and there's so many other things too. I, was, I could be here all day talking about things the Lord, the Lord told those people, and he's telling us on how to live a Christian life. 
but really it's entering in that narrow gate. But what exactly is that narrow gate? Well, first off, it's a way of life. We're here in John 10. Let's look at something here. Might help us to understand what that narrow gate is. And what does it mean to enter that narrow gate? Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Anyone who, seek, who, seeks over the, who sneaks over the wall of a sheepfold rather than going through the gate must surely be a thief and a robber. But the one who enters through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, there's a few things to be learned right here, but the first thing is, is that there's people trying to get in another way. They're trying to do good works to make it to heaven. And you're not going to get there that way. You have to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way. But there's so many that are trying to get in. And those people, those people are thieves and robbers. They're just trying to, to rip off other people and other Christians. They, they're trying to get in another way. But the one who enters in through the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. That's interesting. Now the gatekeeper opens the gate. Now the gatekeeper is the Holy Spirit. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep recognize his voice and come to him. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. After he has gathered his own flock, he walks ahead of them and they follow him because they know his voice. Now, one of the important things about that narrow gate is that we can cultivate the voice of God. The Bible says all that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. And it says, let he who has ears hear what the Spirit is saying. And so this narrow gate is the way to Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit is the one who opens that gate so that when he calls, the sheep will come. We know his voice. Now there's two voices out there. Definitely the voice of the enemy, which we might say it's the voice of this world. And when I see Christians really wrapped up on this world, I know that they're hearing the voice of this world. When they're not living those other things that I showed you, it's because they're wrapped up in this world. They're listening to the voice of this world. And Satan is in this world and he's trying to get people to follow him, but the good shepherd, you got to go through that narrow gate to follow the good shepherd. And uh, <clears throat> that other voice is the voice of the shepherd. And he's calling us and we hear him. You have to be still and know he's God. You need to listen. You need to listen to his voice. He's calling us to do things. He wants us to be a light and a salt on this earth. He's leading us in places where you might get slapped on the cheek, you might get spit on, you might get cursed out. And we need to go and be like sheep. Jesus was like a sheep, it said, before his shearers. He was dumb. He didn't say a word. He didn't defend himself. We've got to quit defending ourselves. We've got to take it on the cheek. We have to go that extra mile, you know, even if we don't get the thank yous that we think we deserve. But we have, to, we have to hear his voice. They won't follow a stranger. They will run from him because they don't know his voice. Those who heard Jesus use this illustration didn't understand what he meant. So he explained it to them. I tell you the truth. I am the gate for the sheep. So I didn't want to jump ahead and say this, but that narrow gate is Jesus himself. And if we're going to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit... We have to enter in to God's presence. We got to listen to his voice as he leads us into paths of righteousness. As he leads us to those places that might be kind of hard to do. But even those people didn't understand what he meant. He said, I am the gate. So what does it mean to enter the narrow gate? It means to enter into Jesus Christ. I live in him. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the true sheep did not listen to them. Yes, I am the gate. Those who come in through me will be saved. They will come and go freely and will find good pastures. The thief's pur purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. 
My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd sacrifices his life for his sheep. A hiring, a hired hand will run when he sees a wolf coming. He will abandon the sheep because they don't belong to him and he isn't their shepherd. And so the wolf attacks them and scatters the flock. The hired hand runs away because he's working only for the money and doesn't really care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own sheep and they know me. Just as my father knows me and I know the father, so I sacrifice my life for the sheep. I have other sheep too that are not in the sheepfold. I must bring them also. They will listen to my voice and there will be one flock with one shepherd. The father loves me because I sacrificed my life so I may take it back again. No one can take my life from me. I sacrifice it voluntarily for I have the authority to lay it down when I want to and also to take it up again. For this is what my father has commanded. When he said these things, the people were again divided in their opinions about him. Some said, he's demon possessed and out of his mind. Why listen to him like that? Others said, this doesn't sound like a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Amen. So the narrow gate is those who are entering into that narrow gate. They want to live that holy life. They want to be a servant of Jesus Christ. They want to follow Jesus. Many were saying he's demon possessed. What do you say he was? Well, you know, we say, oh, no, he definitely wasn't demon possessed. He was the son of God. He's the savior of the world. Well, if he was, then how come we're not following him? Think about that. A lot of Christians that are just plain not following Jesus. They're just caught up in this world. So I ask you the question, are you following Jesus today? Do you enter in to those good pastures that he's talking about? He's talking about salvation. He's talking about, are you excited that this might be the time, the year that Jesus returns? Or are you disappointed because you're not going to get a chance to see your child grow up or, or get your grandchildren and, and so forth? Well, man, wouldn't it be better for your children to grow up in heaven? Wow. You know, we got to really analyze what gates we're going in. Because if you're really going in that narrow gate, then you're going to want to start living like Jesus. Lay down your life with people. Sacrifice time in prayer and intercession. Pray in the Spirit always. You know, pray. the Bible says pray continuously. Well, it doesn't mean to just pray. It really means worship and to praise and to pray. You know, if you just don't, I just don't know how, how in the world can I pray all day long? Just worship. Just sing. The Bible says with with songs and hymns and spiritual song, making melody in your heart unto the Lord, giving him thanks for all things. All of that is praying without ceasing. Just as we were on vacation, wherever we went, I was singing under my breath and worshiping and praying for people. So many people around. And I was just praying. I don't know, I didn't know who was saved or not, but I was just praying for all of them. You know, we got to face facts. One day the Lord is going to come. And we need to be ready. We need to be busy serving the Lord. You know, we need to be busy going in and out of that narrow gate. Jesus would go up in the mountain at night and get filled with God's presence. And then do his will during the day. Constantly busy. We, 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 I know we're constantly busy. We're having a job. We have to go work. We're raising the kids. But believe me. You don't have to neglect God to do your job. You don't have to neglect God to raise your kids. You don't have to neglect God to go on vacation. You don't have to neglect God to go anywhere. Matter of fact, everywhere you go, you are light to this world. Let that light so shine. Wherever you go, grocery store, post office, to the doctor's office, anywhere you go, out on the road, that you are a light to this world. Always think you're keeping judgment from coming down on, onto the people that are around you because you are here. You are salt to the earth. So understand that. 
So what does it mean to be saved? What's next? Live the life for Jesus. Be ready in season and out of season to tell of the hope that you have in you. Repent of your sins. Forgive people that have harmed you. Just walk uprightly before your God. You need to enter into those good pastures so that God will then lift all of that heaviness off of you. And when you come back in this world, yeah, you're going to be dealing with stuff. And by the end of the day, you're going to be overwhelmed again. Go back into good pastures and eat of that good grain that's there. Partake of the Lord. Eat of the bread of life so you'll have bread to offer. I want to pray for you this morning. This is a simple message. But yet sometimes it's the simple messages that have more meaning. And all I'm trying to do is have you, have you analyze your life and look at yourself in the mirror and don't forget what kind of person you are and want to be like Jesus. I'm trying to tell you that there's a place you can go wherever you are in the midst of a crowd that you can go into good pasture with the Lord and you can worship and praise no matter where you are. Let me pray for you. Father, I pray for these that are watching me right now. Lord, they have things going on in their lives. They're overwhelmed. Some are so overwhelmed. They said, how can we live that way? And some of them might even have turned off the video, but I pray for them. And I pray right now that they will understand that we need the help of the Holy Spirit. We need to go in through that gate that the Holy Spirit opens up and go into that good pasture and spend time with God, eating his word, his truth, putting it into our being. We need to be ready. I have failed many times, Lord, and I had to repent. And you have made all things new, and you have strengthened me. And I'm getting stronger every day in you. I choose to live for you. I choose to obey you. I choose to surrender to you. So you'll show me what it means to be saved in this world. In Jesus' name, amen.